By way of introduction, I'm Dan Barnard. If you haven't met me yet, I'm one of the pastors here. And if you haven't been with us the last few weeks, we've been running through 1 Thessalonians. Well, last week we finished that book, and now we thought, why not just continue on into the second letter of Paul to the Thessalonian church? So that's what we'll be doing this morning. We'll be picking up where Paul begins in his second letter to that church. But before we do that, why don't we do a quick review of where we've been? So in, in 1 Thessalonians, it was a new church. There were young believers there. They'd been, been planted by Paul. Um, they were growing quickly in their faith. They were imitating their teachers. They were becoming a model to people everywhere. They were doing a good job. They looked at the word. They accepted what Paul taught as the word of God, not just the word of men which was great, even knowing that they'd be persecuted for it. Paul had had a special place in his heart for this church, so much so that he sent his protege, Timothy, to go and check in on them, make sure that they were still going strong. So very important to him. And, And lastly, we talked about Jesus coming back. Paul was giving this this church hope for the future, that it's not just gonna be rough for a couple years until you die. It may be that case, but Jesus is going to come back and make all things right. So that's the background we come into looking at the second letter to the Thessalonians. Why don't we pray and then we'll dive in. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for who you are, for why we sing. Thank you that we can say how marvelous and how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. (laughs) Well, Lord, we will pay attention this morning. (laughs) Thank you for laughter, and thank you for joy, and thank you for the joy we'll know with you forevermore when we know you. Lord, we just pray that you'd open our hearts to hear from your word this morning. We love you and we praise you. Amen. So I'll give you a moment to turn to 2 Thessalonians, and we'll start chapter 1, verse 1 says this, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we set up a couple things here. We set up the author. Who's writing this? Well, Paul's writing it. Who's Paul? We know who Paul is. But he planted the church. When you look at Acts 17, 4, 10, and 14, it talks about the Thessalonian church starting out. Who's this Silvanus guy? Well, that's Silas, just another stylized name for him. Paul's missionary companion, his brother in Christ that went on many of his missionary journeys with him. And then Timothy, the the young pastor that Paul had sent to check on the Thessalonian church after his first letter. So that's who's here and who's writing this. So who's the audience then? Well, the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have these men writing, these men, uh, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. They're, they're there when the church is founded. They're ready to respond to the troubles the church is having. And that's why they wrote the first letter. Paul sent Timothy to check up on them because he wanted to be able to answer questions in person. He wanted them to continue their spiritual education and enrichment. But who is he writing it to now? Well, the same people. It says the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to the believers, to the body of Christ, those who are in God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who make their home in him, those who trust him for salvation, whose lives have been changed by his glorious grace. So we've seen the author, we know the audience. Now let's look at how Paul addresses them. He says, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the typical Greek greeting would be karen, the word would be. It means favor. The typical Jewish greeting would include peace in it somewhere. Peace, you know, shalom, peace from God. Paul changed the word karen to charis, which is grace, which changes that word favor to unmerited favor, specifically God's unmerited favor, his grace. 
I love that. What a marvelous way to greet someone. May God's undeserved favor be on you and peace from God himself. It was starting out just an amazing reminder of the grace they'd been given in Christ and the peace they could know through relationship with him. To note also, just, just starting out here, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, God and Lord both convey divine meaning. So Paul is rightly ascribing Godhood to both Father and Son. So a lot packed into that verse. So where does he go from there? Well, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right. Because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love of you for one another is increasing. So here Paul lets the Thessalonian church know how much they mean to him. How much? Well, enough that Paul should be continually thanking the Lord for the privilege of seeing two things happening. First, he sees their faith growing abundantly. He's excited to see this church that he planted growing in their faith, trusting God more and more. He sees they're going to God, they're resting in his truth, they're trusting him for life now, but also in the hereafter. And he repeats this thought from his first letter. He's thanking God that they were steadfast in their faith. But in the second letter, he extols them not simply for holding to the faith, but for actively growing in it. Not just holding on to it, not just sticking with it, but growing and and letting it become more and more of their lifestyle. The love of every one of you, he says, for one another is increasing. So all through 1 Thessalonians, Paul commends the Thessalonian church. He says, you guys are an example to all of Macedonia. He tells them, you guys are my hope and joy. I get to boast about you to everybody, not because of something I did, but because of how much you're following Christ. He says, this church is my crown of boasting when Jesus comes back, when he comes back. Again, not that he'd boast of his own part in that, but in the way that this church was following Christ. He was so proud of them. And here he goes a step further even. He praises them because their love for one another doesn't stay at that level. It increased more, if it was possible. It increased more. So what an amazing compliment he pays to this church. They were good. They were excellent. They were glorious in their love for, for one another before, but now they're even better. You know, as I prepared for the sermon this week, I went through my annual review time at work. Okay, yes, I know, it's July. We have a strange fiscal year at my, at my work and uh, at the bank. And, and how many of you guys like annual review time? I have some thumbs down. Okay, cool. So, so I have... Um, Annual review time always brings a, an overwhelming sense of dread for me, right? Because from some of my early reviews where people would say things like, well, you did this six months ago and we could have told you to fix it, but we didn't say anything about it. And now we're holding you responsible for every time you did it since then. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> it's not a fun time. And then I have to do reviews for, uh, I have 16 people that work for me. Not looking forward to that either. <laughs> Mostly because people um, tend to rate themselves much more highly than they ought, whether because of ignorance or supreme confidence, I don't know, but uh, in any case, not my favorite time of the year. What am I gonna be reminded of? What am I gonna learn about how terrible I've been? Um, what simple thing could I have changed? that would have made me a better employee or coworker. Thankfully this year, I wasn't surprised by anything. I have an awesome boss who, who does a good job of making sure I know where I am along the way. That's good. And trust me, hang with me guys, this is going somewhere, okay? <laughs> Paul's letter to the Thessalonians here is in one sense a follow-up to their last review. In the last letter, he told them what an amazing job they were doing. And in a sense, he set some goals for them going forward. 
Remember in chapter 4, Paul tells the church to avoid complacency, to keep growing, to keep their foot on the gas, to keep learning and trusting God more and more. And so here, in the second letter, we see one of the hallmarks of a great coach, or in this case, a great disciple maker. He follows up, he praises them for doing what they asked, he lets them know where they stand. Their love for one another, as good as it was, has grown even more. Their joy, their, their trusting in the Lord has grown, and that's wonderful. And he's following up and saying, good job. Keep that going, keep growing, keep being in that example. So as we look at this, my question is, when was your last annual review with Jesus? When was the last time you took stock of where you've been and where you're going next? When was the last time you sat down and honestly evaluated your life versus the scripture, prayerfully measured it against what the Bible says and what what a believer should be doing? Not for the purpose of feeling terrible because you failed, but to see what God's done in your life, to look back at all the things that he's blessed you with, to look back at all the ways that, you know what? Maybe I should have trusted God more there. And maybe this next year, maybe this next time, I will trust him and see how he comes through for me. If you haven't done that, it's pretty hard to keep yourself from becoming complacent. Because like my employees that rate themselves as ultimate role models in everything, Maybe they have a a wrong view of how they're conducting their lives. Maybe they just haven't taken a look at it. Maybe they just don't know what the standard actually is. So, but I I don't want you to be bummed out about that. I want you to look at that as an opportunity to maybe take some time, get with the Lord, say, hey, God, what can I do this year? What can I do going forward? What can I do to change to let you have more control so that I can be more like your son. Look at how Paul lifts up the Thessalonian believers here. He says, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith and all your persecutions and the afflictions that you're enduring. He talks to this church and he says, you guys are suffering and people know about it, but they also know that you're holding strong even through that. He says, no, your suffering is not in vain. He's letting these harried, harassed, persecuted believers know that because they're continuing to follow Jesus in spite of the cost, that their sacrifices are serving as an example to the churches of God. Essentially, you're an example to everyone of how to follow Christ wholeheartedly and grow in love even through such awful circumstances. Can you honestly look at your life and say that you're an example to everyone of how you should deal with difficult circumstances? I know I'm not. Not as much as I'd like to be. But, but in trusting in Christ, we can be that. Paul continues in verse 5. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you're also suffering. Look at what Paul says here. This, this is evidence of God's righteous judgment. What is this pointing to is the question I had as I was reading through here. And this is where I, I like to use multiple translations sometimes because it can be helpful in understanding a particularly difficult or unclear passage. Usually, I I like to use the ESV, you'll see up there, because it's a fairly readable translation, but it's more toward the word-for-word side of things. I like that. That's comfortable for me. But especially in Paul's letters, um, he likes run-on sentences. He likes to go on and on and on about a subject, and I like to have some other translations available to get a broader idea of what the author's talking about. The Christian Standard Bible renders this as, It is clear evidence of God's righteous judgment that you'll be counted worthy of God's kingdom for which you're also suffering. The NLT says, and God will use this persecution to show his justice and make you worthy of his kingdom for which you're suffering. And the NASB says, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you'll be considered worthy 
of the kingdom of God for which you are indeed suffering. So we get this idea that Paul here is letting the Thessalonians know that they're holding strong to faith in Christ in spite of their persecution does two things. It shows their inclusion in God's kingdom because their faith is true. It didn't fall away when tough things happened. But it will also show God's justice when those who persecute Christians and reject the gracious gift of God are punished. So, hold on for a little while. It's going to get a little bit Baptist. Um, So, you know, I'm a banker in my day job. And when when I do loans, I always have to go through, this is what the loan is about, but I also have to spell out what happens if you don't follow through with the terms of the loan. I have to be the bad guy for a second and talk about the negative aspects of it because I want people to really understand what they're getting into or getting out of. I think we do ourselves a disservice if we ignore what the scripture says about what we're going to be talking here. So bear that in mind. 2 Thessalonians 1.6 says this, Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you? Hmm. I thought we're supposed to turn the other cheek. I thought I thought we're we're supposed to just let people do what they're gonna do, right? Well, note a couple things. One, it's God who does the repaying. It's not us. There's a huge temptation when someone hurts us to be to want to be the ven- the avenging hand of God, to have that vengeance. Romans 12, 19 harkens back to Deuteronomy 32, 35, reminding us, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. People will be repaid according to their sin. Think of it this way, okay? In the modern church, especially in America, we focus much of our time on God's infinite love. Rightly so, because God's love is so amazing. God is love. And because he loved us so much, he lived the perfect life we couldn't live in our place. He died the death that we deserve, willingly going to the most heinous death imaginable, though he had committed no sin. Why? Because he wanted to save us from that sin. But we can't forget that in the incredible mercy of God, there must also be justice. why Christ had to be punished for our sins, as Isaiah 53 says. It's why he needed to be crushed to pay the debt that we cannot. God did not just forget your sin. Do you understand that? He did not just forget it, he took it on himself. He paid the debt himself on the cross. The Father sent his only Son to die in your place. So with that as the background, knowing what God has done to save us from what's coming, let's look at what comes when we don't know Christ. Verse 7, Paul says, And to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So not only is justice going to be done, but relief will be granted to those who are afflicted. When? When Christ returns. When all the scores are finally settled, when the day of judgment comes and Jesus returns in glory, and when he comes back, he's bringing his mighty angels with him. Now, you've seen TV, you've seen kids' cartoons, you know what angels look like, right? Wimpy little dudes with a little harp and a halo. Um, I'm not talking about halos and white robes and silly golden harps like in Looney Tunes. Paul specifically calls them God's mighty angels. Lest we forget, an angel took the firstborn of Egypt at the first Passover in Exodus 12. Second Kings chapter 1935, we learn of an angel that God sends to destroy 185,000 men in a single day. These aren't kids' things. God's judgment is complete. 
Remember when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26? Peter cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant, and Christ says, put the sword away. Don't you understand that I could ask God for help and he'd put more than 12 legions of angels at my command? Well, he uses the word legion, so I assume he's using the Roman metric, and that's 6,000. So 12 legions is 72,000, and one angel was capable of killing 185,000 men in a sitting. So Christ here in the garden says that essentially, though he has willingly taken on the form of a servant, if he wanted to deal with us by force, he could wipe out 13 billion people without batting an eye. It's pretty serious. So when it says Jesus is coming back with his mighty angels, for those of us who are looking forward to him, who know him, who are expecting him, who love him, it'll be a joyous event. But oh boy, for those of us who don't, it will not. Angels are the messengers of God. We need to remember that God uses them to manifest his power on this earth. And and Paul says it this way in verses 8 and 9. They're coming back in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Again, we as Christians look forward to Christ coming back. But Paul paints a very different picture of what those who refuse to obey the gospel of Christ can expect. Again, again, remember, God is perfectly merciful, but he's also perfectly just. And in his mercy and justice, his wrath will be carried out on sin, specifically on all those who reject his gracious gift. It's not a scare tactic. We're not trying to scare anyone into believing. What this is, is the truth. You need to understand what's coming. Paul continues in verse 9. He says, they'll suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. You know, there are some who think that hell's not real, that everyone ends up in heaven, that because the Bible says in Philippians 2 that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord means that no one will reject Christ in the end. Got me thinking, you know, both my parents dealing with cancer, and they've both had a bunch of different doctors, and I've seen four, four types of doctors that deal with cancer. One of them looks at it and goes, ah, there's nothing there, you're fine. Doesn't acknowledge the problem. One of them says, there's no point doing anything, we can't do anything about it, so you're just, you know, we're gonna stop treatment, you're stuck. One of them says, well, it's there, But there's not a whole lot we can do about it, and uh, let's just make you feel as good as you can while, while you can. Those are the three that I've seen most often. Do you want to go to one of those doctors? Probably not, right? You want the fourth kind that says, it's here, but we need to get rid of it. It's going to hurt to get rid of it. It's going to cost a lot to get rid of it. But it'll save you. That's the kind of doctor you want. And so when I look at this, and I look at talking about hell, and I look at, look at it's not something we want to hold on to and want to think about all the time. But as a church and as a pastor, I have to talk about it. Because I don't want you all to come in here and just be happy about your sin I don't want you to feel loved, but be headed for eternal separation from God. And I hope and pray that you all here know Jesus, and so this is a moot point. But but the right kind of doctor is the one that says, let's address this, it's going to be hard, but we need to get rid of it. Just like the right kind of church looks at sin and says, we need to get rid of it because there is hell coming. And how do we get rid of it? Through Christ. Look at what Jesus says here. Hell is not just a scare tactic. What does Christ say? 
in Luke 16 through 29, or in, through, I'm sorry, 16, 19 and forward, we learn that the separation is final. Jesus shares a parable about a rich man and Lazarus. He says, there's a rich man who is clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he's comforted here and you're in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And besides all this, oh, I'm sorry. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So what's Jesus saying here? What he's saying is people make choices. They choose whether they'll have life through Christ, through faith in him, or whether they will earn death, not only physical but spiritual, which is the just repayment for denying Christ. He says there's a chasm that's fixed that none may cross over. It's final, it's over. When people die in their sin, they've locked in their choices. Jesus confirms this in Matthew 7. You know, when he talks about, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, I never knew you. He talks about, in that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, going to the outer darkness. Christ talks about how it's final. And Paul here in, in 2 Thessalonians 1 says that those who reject Christ will suffer eternal destruction, away from the Lord and from the glory of his might. It's an utterly terrifying prospect. If you know me, you'll know there are certain things that I can't stand, among which are wet socks and when people refuse to use their turn signals. <laughs> but what I truly can't stand is to be alone. And I don't just mean like I need a couple hours to, to space out and work on stuff in my garage or, you know, play a video game. What I mean is feeling alone, like I have no one. It's the worst feeling in the world. Imagine, if you will, what it would be like to be separated from God. Who, even in your loneliest moments here and now, is still with you. Imagine instead that you spent your life choosing yourself instead of him. And when you die, he says, okay. You didn't want me in life. You only wanted yourself. So I'll give you exactly what you wanted, and you get an eternity to spend with just yourself. For some people, there's no amount of evidence, nothing that will convince them because they so love their sin, they so love this world, they so love themselves that following Christ seems foolish to them. Speaking of seeming foolish to people, you ever driven north on 65? You've seen that sign. You know, for the longest time I thought, man, why would you do it that way? But then I got to realizing, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's exactly what people need to know. Because they go about in their lives so obsessed with themselves and their needs and their wants and their sin 
that they forget something's coming. Again, God is just. Everyone who ends up in hell deserves to be there. That's something we need to remember. It's not unjust, it's not wrong for God to separate people from himself because that's what they want. He's giving them what they want. I'll go so far as to say that everyone who ends up in hell truly wants to be there. C.S. Lewis says that the door to hell is locked from the inside. No one accidentally goes to hell. No one is accidentally separated from God forever. By the choices they make, by the sins they commit, and, and what they do there, they, they earn the wages of sin, which is death, as Paul says in Romans 6.23. Lest we who know Christ become boastful, remember that apart from him, we would be just as lost. It's very popular today in feel-good Christian churches for the mega pastor wearing $5,000 sneakers to get up on stage to clapping and cheering, say things like, you are enough. You can do this. It's been in you all along. Brothers and sisters, nothing could be further from the truth. You are not enough. Christ is enough. Only Christ is enough. And if I'm honest with myself and if you're honest with yourselves, you know that that's true. It's nothing in us, nothing special about us that secures our salvation. It is only by trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross that we can be graciously, mercifully, and because of his sacrifice, perfectly, justly saved. Paul follows up in verse 10. He says, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you is believed. So this contrast is clear. Those who seek after themselves, who reject the Savior, will be separated from God forever. But those who look forward to his coming because we know him, because we trust him, we've placed our faith in his death and resurrection for our eternal security when he comes back, we'll glorify him. We'll marvel at him. What a difference that is. On the one hand, we have the choice of eternal destruction because we've chosen to rebel. On the other hand, the promise of eternal life secured through belief in Christ Jesus our Lord. Doesn't seem like much of a choice when you look at it that way, does it? Verse 11, he continues, to this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. So, to this end, so that, so that you would be able to do all these things that God set aside for you. He keeps asking God to make them worthy of his calling that he'd fulfill every good resolve and he'd allow them to keep growing in their faith, growing in their good works by his power, not their own. Why? Well, he wraps up the chapter so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of this all of this knowledge, all this instruction, all of the letters that he writes are so that Jesus' name would be glorified and that one day we'd be glorified in and through Christ in his glorious return. So as we wrap up and look back at this chapter, what do we do? First, take stock of where you are. It doesn't have to be the last year. It could be the last week. Start small. Look at what God's done in your life. Look at where you've been and where you want to go and examine your life against the scripture to see if it's so. Understanding that it's not, it's not about your power, it's about God's power. So if you're not where you want to be, then be honest with God about that. Ask him for his help, he'll help. Look forward to how you can trust him more and grow 
and loving your brothers and sisters. Now, now our church has an awesome, awesome time with this. You guys are amazing. The love that I see week in and week out, day in and day out, is amazing. But keep it up. Keep growing in that. Next, we know that Jesus is coming back in power. Look forward to him coming back. Know that if you're persecuted for believing him, that vengeance is the Lord's. And finally, know that hell is a real place and a just punishment for those who reject Christ. But while we're still alive, there's still time to believe in Christ. So if you don't know him, I pray that you would. I pray that you reject sin and self and trade it for the amazing life that's in Christ. And if you do know him, no one around you is too gone to be saved. They need to hear the gospel. They need to know that this is coming. Just like if you saw someone with their AirPods in, standing in the middle of the street looking at their phone when a bus was coming, if you're a good person, you'd probably tap them on the shoulder at the very least and say, uh, hey, there's a bus coming. And if they weren't going to move, you might even tackle them. Don't tackle people. <laughs> the point being, there's still time for people to come to Christ while they're still here. There's still time. You have the opportunity to share the most life-giving message in the universe with people who are dying in darkness and need the light of Christ. So don't let that pass. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that if we know you, we have joy forevermore. Lord, we just ask for those that don't know you, that they would trade the life of sin and selfishness for eternal pleasures at your feet. Lord, help us to be bold in examining our lives versus your word. Help us to desire to be more like your son. And help us to share your life-giving message of salvation with everyone around us. We love you. We praise you. It's in your glorious name, in the name of your son, we pray. Amen.